Hey, Ryan here. Does your company have a commercial or industrial IoT project coming down the pipe? Reach out to Vary and let our world-class specialists in hardware, software, data science, and design bring it to life. And what I've come to appreciate is that actually high margin software has always been built and, and sequenced on what the newly commoditized hardware is. You're listening to Over the Air, IoT, Connected Devices, and The Journey, brought to you by Vary. In each episode, we have sharp, unfiltered conversations with executives about their IoT journeys, the mistakes they made, the lessons they learned, and what they wish they'd known when they started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Over the Air, IoT, Connected Devices, and The Journey. Today, we're going to be talking about robotics as a service with my very good friend, Paul Willard, founding partner of Grep VC. Paul, thanks for coming today. Thanks for having me, Ryan. So first question, I'm sure a humongous percentage of our audience is asking. We're talking about robotics as a service. We'll get to what it is in a moment. But how did you, Paul Willard, first get interested in this space in the first place? About eight years ago, I was pitched by this company called Zipline. And Zipline operates robotic delivery aircraft. They can take, in the beginning, they could take two units of blood a long distance and drop them where it's needed and then fly home. And they could get the blood there very quickly over any terrain in all weather. Their launch country was Rwanda. And when I saw this company, I kept seeing a software company. I saw a SaaS company, as a matter of fact, because to me, the sale was the autopilot that was actually flying the plane. People were paying to get a delivery. The, the delivery could have been done before by a, a, man, a human pilot. The business model wouldn't work, but technically you could have used remote control human pilots. So it was really the software that I saw. When I talked to other people about it, they kept saying, no, that's an airplane company. It's a hardware company. And I was like, no, 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 no. I work for Boeing. I know what a complex hardware company looks like. I know what complex hardware margins look like. This isn't that. These are like off-the-shelf parts slapped together. And so I made that investment back when and stayed with the company. And I started to look at and analyze and run with, you know, is this a software or a services company, a robotic service company? Uh, like SaaS, or is it a hardware company? And I came in very definitively that it is a robotics as a service company. Then I started looking around for more. And so I invested in a second robotics as a service company called Cobalt Robotics. And you know now I'm seeing more and more, and I've, I've invested in several others since then. But that's where it, that's where it originally came from, was from Zipline. And and I, I'm somewhat familiar with Zipline in large part because of of our friendship and I followed them uh, closely. But can you talk about some of the the metrics? Uh, I know viewers at home are thinking metrics doesn't sound very interesting, but like some of the the enormous improvements that they've brought to the blood delivery world in Africa. So you know from X to Y, can you just rattle off a few of the the more impressive ones? Yeah, you know, when we started out in Rwanda, the numbers that I remember, so they might not be exactly right, but they're close. Sure. Um, are that 10% of the time the a needed blood product wasn't available. Blood's a tricky one. It has a 7-day shelf life. It's got A, B positive, A, a B O positive, negative, and there are platelets, whole blood and plasma. So there's a lot of permutations and they only have a 7-day shelf life. And so before we started, I think there was a 10% outage rate, and I think there was also a 50% waste rate. So it would hit a seven days and never be used and, and have to be thrown away. Mm. And so after we started, or now, now that we're going and we have coverage across the country, the waste has gone either literally or very nearly to zero. And simultaneously, the outage rate has gone to zero. Incredible. Uh, and... And they've done that while cutting the total blood inventory in the country something like in half. So it, it has saved so much money in inventory holding costs while simultaneously upping the service level way up. And my favorite stat related to Zipline is just that uh, maternal mortality is one of the leading avoidable causes of death in, in the world, really, but certainly in Africa as well. 
And there are places in Rwanda right now where the maternal mortality rate is lower than in the U.S. Wow. In fact, there are, there are places that Zipline is serving right now that have had zero maternal deaths since they've been operating, which is qu- quite impressive. Incredible. And, and so, you know, but we're like Zipline is an incredible company for the people that are close to it. But what's near and dear to your heart is, you know, obviously robotics as a service. Talk a little bit about what is robotics as a service and how it came about. Yeah. So robotics as a service are rental robots that are performing some job to provide value, much like accounting software that you might use to keep your books at a company. Sure. You pay monthly to use this software ongoing, covers storage, covers upgrades, it covers all the normal things. And the same with the robots. So they're performing some service on an ongoing basis for a company. So they want to be rented, not bought. That's good because enterprise enterprise products like to be rented anyway. They like to be OPEX, not CAPEX. Um, consumers like to buy, but enterprises like to rent. Mm-hmm. And so they work out that way. And they have, you know, their business model looks much like SaaS because there's this upfront cost, just like SaaS has a, a customer acquisition cost in the beginning. And so robotics as a service companies have customer acquisition and a bill of materials, if you will, the cost of building the robot. And then they rent it and they recover both of those things over time, just like in SaaS. What I've come to realize, because I'm on roughly my third generation now of robotics as a service, uh, early stage startups that I've, I'm investing in. And what I've come to appreciate is that actually high margin software has always been built and, and sequenced on what the newly commoditized hardware is. So let me let me go back with that to mainframes building banking software back in the 1970s and 80s because mainframes were commoditized enough that they could provide value to the banks with these perfect calculations. And then but later PCs coming in the late 90s web servers coming and boom there's the world wide web and suddenly there's tons of software being built for the world wide web. You know laptops, mobile phones, And the things that led to robotics as a service, in my opinion, are mobile phones bringing us sensors, inertial reference units, cameras, cutting the cost down to really, really low commodity. Right. Lithium-ion batteries coming out of laptops, and then direct, direct, really high reliability, lightweight, high torque, super maintenance-free motors coming from Tesla, really, and, and turning those into a widespread commodity product. And you can take that set of hardware that I just talked about and package it up and build a whole bunch of different software platforms on top of it that can provide value in the real world. So going back to Zipline as the example that we've been using, you're basically renting drones to provide the service of having a thing dropped at the exact location you're trying to get it to, in this case, blood. Yep. And if you went to the doctors that this is the providing a service to, so to speak, and you said, hey, do you want to buy some robot airplanes and operate them and like figure out how to recharge them and <laughs> get them to drop things in the right place and adjust for wind or whatever? They'd be like, what are you talking about? Right. Like, they, they just want the blood to show up. So it, it's, it, it really is parallel to SaaS in that, in that respect. Right, right. The, the, what they care about is having the thing delivered reliably on time to a particular location. They don't really care how teleportation does it whatever and it just happens in this case that this delivery mechanism as a service is uh, is is the most efficient by far way to get that done and in other cases other robots would be able to provide those services more efficiently than whatever existing solution yeah and we already talked about the cost reduction from reducing inventory and centralizing in- inventory to cover you know mm-hmm. your needs but there are other things too covid vaccine needs a super cold freezer. You don't really want to be putting them all over the country, hundreds of them in. You'd much rather put a few giant ones in the middle and deliver to a huge radius around that very quickly, so quickly that you don't have to worry about the spoiling problems and things. You're, you're like, doctor says, hey, I'm going to start putting vaccines in arms in a half hour. You're like, boom, here comes the parachute, right? <laughs> right, right. So talking just briefly about 
Paul himself, you know, for those who don't know, I've known Paul for a number of years. Paul was the venture capitalist that backed the tech company I was at previously. By the way, like Paul, I always admired your approach. You were super helpful in us building that company and driving it to an exit, which I always admired. But what struck me about your fund now is it's so, the focus is quite a bit different than, you know, what subtraction capital had at that time, which I would have characterized as a much more like traditional SaaS approach. Um, I don't know exactly what you guys' investing thesis was, but Grep is definitely robotics as a service. Talk about like the journey to to this place for you. Enterprise software was subtraction capital, by the way. Enterprise. And so I would view RAS as, as a narrow slice of enterprise software also. Got it. It does have this hardware component in it though. So although I can think of it like enterprise software, I think that's because I designed real hardware products uh, as an aerodynamics engineer at Boeing. And so you, you got to be careful if you've never done that before, because telling the difference between a hardware company and RAS is really important if you want right. to be a successful investor. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I, I think it's because I had that unique background that I ended up digging into this one slice of enterprise software because it, it was a place where I felt like I could help add unique value. I was also the CMO at Atlassian. And so I was pretty deep on just sort of understanding SaaS as well. And the combination of somebody who's super deep in SaaS and super deep in hardware, you know, as well as an engineer that turned into a CMO, you, you just, you won't find many people with sort of that particular set of things all together. And it made me want to just dig in. Yeah. I don't know how many former Boeing engineers go on to become CMOs. I think that's I think that's probably somewhat rare. We're actually going to talk about another former Boeing employee in a minute. But so, you know, speaking about your firm, obviously, as a longtime Unix programmer, I know what GREP stands for. But can you talk a little bit about the name and what that what that translates to? Yeah, you bet. Um, so uh, GREP's an inside name. Yeah. It, it is a, a Unix command. It's one of the first Unix commands you typically learn because it's a search Unix command. It lets you search typically inside of files, but you can grab other things too. And so it's, it's sort of an inside joke. I always admire the name lowercase capital because it's, it's sort of putting an investment in its proper place. <laughs> like we're, we're, not, we're not doing the work here, you know? And so I wanted a super generic name, search. Yeah, we do that. We search for companies but one that appeals particularly to technical founders, very technical founders, which is the kind that I like to invest in. Right. Yeah. I, I anticipate that when you guys are up running, we're going to see a lot of super technical founders. Do you think that's accurate? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of technical and Boeing, I was doing the, the interview prep for, uh, or the pre-interview with our next guest, the most recent former CEO of Boeing, Dennis Mullenberg. And we discovered that we both know Paul Willard. So I know how I know Dennis. How do you know Dennis Mullenberg? Dennis and I are actually alumnus of the same college, Iowa State University. You know, little known fact, but computational fluid dynamics, modeling airflow around something in a computer. It wasn't invented at Iowa State University, but for all intents and purposes, it was productionalized there. And everybody learned to do it from there. And both Dennis and I went there at the same time, actually. He was getting his master's, though, and I was getting my undergrad. We both ended up at Boeing. We, you know, Dennis is great. Dennis's wife is great. Dennis's cousin is great. He's at Boeing, too. Hey, Tim, if you're listening. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I mean, he's just great. He's like the real deal, sort of. Iowa, practical, just sincere person. And we used to play basketball together after work together, sort of in the Boeing intramural leagues. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, he ended up a manager on the Joint Strike Fighter program, which was a VTOL airplane that he and I both worked on while I was at Boeing back when uh, as well. And yeah, we, we worked together with Iowa State University as, as alumnus. Uh, and so, yeah, we... I, I greatly appreciate my long time uh, knowledge of and association with Dennis. You guys are, from a background perspective, about as different as two people could be. So you've got like Mr. Legacy Boeing guy, intern to CEO before retiring. And then you've got, you know, Paul Willard, who's been everywhere, done all kinds of, you know, huge things in tech. 
do you do you find that when you guys get together you've still got plenty of common ground to talk about oh yeah i mean we started the same right because we we both grew up not in any sort of big city environment and we both got aerodynamics engineering degrees we'll both go very deep on aero with anybody who wants to and enjoy doing it very very genuinely enjoy doing it sure and we still enjoy doing it today where i think we're on a couple advisory boards for startups together. I think we've invested in the same company a couple of times now too. Um, sometimes even by accident, like without knowing the other one was there, which is funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that I think that's I've got that here on the uh, the docket to bring up as well. But so coming back to robotics as a service for a second, everybody at home is like, you know, this thing has totally derailed. But it's all right, folks, we're bringing it back. So you, you looking at this space, you've been in robotics as a service for for a minute now. For people out there that are uh, either tasked, uh, they're, they're either you know at, at a startup that they're trying to, to get going, or they're maybe a larger enterprise and they've got an initiative that they're trying to develop. What's something that you wish people would stop doing? You know, you, you just want to scream, guys, no more, don't do this anymore. So I think about the pitches that I've heard too many times that you know, you, you worry about things being a waste of not just your time, but the, the, this talented, smart person that is telling you about it's time, really. Sure. Like, you don't want to waste your time, you know? And the things that I see are, I mean, most com it's, it's always related to the hardware can't do what you think it can, and it won't be able to in the next two years. So therefore, a startup isn't going to work. There's a version of it that, that, that like, Aerodynamics is not on Moore's law. Right. Neither are battery. Neither are neither are batteries. By the way, the 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 best version of a Concorde that you could build today, like Boom, the supersonic airplane, which I'm an investor in. So, um, aerodynamically, you know, it's probably five percent better than the one designed in the 1970s, somewhere in that ballpark at least, because that's that's the limit, and it's not getting any better. It's not like now now there's nothing left. There's no room left. In arrow. So, so if you think that you need a lift to drag ratio that's off the charts compared to everything else, your startup's not going to work. Same on batteries. I use a half life, you, you know, Moore's law compute speed doubling at the same cost every year. And I use a half life on batteries, so battery capacity doubling at the same cost of seven years. My hardcore battery friends tell me I'm a little bit aggressive, that it's probably more like nine years, but somewhere in that ballpark, you know. And so if you're working on a, co a company that needs a battery with double the capacity in order to be successful in your MVP, which better be sort of one or two years off, like you're going to have a problem. And then finally, same thing with some hardware. I, you know, I don't know the best example on this, but some, sometimes you'll be trying to get something out of hardware that it, it can't typically do today. And you're saying, oh, I know the best example of this. Uh, robot arms. I'm going to get some grief for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't care. <laughs> um, <laughs> but robot arms, say five years ago, people were saying, we're going to use this arm to do this. And the arms are going to be super cheap in like a year. And they, they aren't. They're still, you still got to spend 20, 30 grand for a, a nice arm, right? And so if your business model is going to need a $2,000 arm and you're expecting that in two years, you're in trouble. Now, one day that won't be true, right? And, and I keep watching for the, for the day when I think a $2,000 arm is two years away, because then all of a sudden I'm going to start looking around and I'm going to go, okay, who can make the most value with an arm? Right. <laughs> and we'll start, then we'll start looking for arm, arm robots, so to speak. Interesting. So like the, the thing that you see most often, I mean, you, I came from uh, an energy storage background a few years ago. And, uh, and in fact, w one of our guests here in a few weeks is, well, was the head of flying cars at Uber. That business unit has been acquired. I, I expect that he's going to have a, probably a very similar view, you know, that like electric, you're only able to cr cram so much energy into a unit of space and that, it, you know, it's not like computing power where there's a lot of uh, room for upward improvement. You, is this something that you see a lot? You know, you, you see it all the time. And I'm, I think I was on a panel with him on a stage at a flying stuff conference a couple of years ago. Okay. And okay. Got, 
And I got booed because I said, lithium ion batteries are not going to get us there. Like the VTOL airplanes, they, they're just, they're not going to have the operational range for a long time. So if you, if you have investors and you're willing to work on something that's not going to see the light of day for 10 years, yeah, fine. But if you're saying we're going to have an MVP up ready to use in two years and land on the top of a building, it was like, not only is the autopilot a problem and certifying an autonomous plane, but the batteries are so far past critical in terms of what you need to get out of them that you can't afford to throw a 200 pounds of pilot allowance in. And that's why you're driving the autopilot. I'm like, it's just, it's a tailspin. You're backwards before you start, you know? Right. Right. Um, but I will say since then I found I did find the magic material that's going to make VTOL airplanes work. But I just recently, I just recently found it and it's literally two years away right now. <laughs> Is this something that you can talk about today? Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't think it's ever been talked about before, interestingly. But the company's called FuelX, and they impregnate aluminum with hydrogen. And so you can take this aluminum and you add the hydrogen in. It's a big, messy process um, that only a few people in the world can do, and they work at FuelX. And then you have aluminum hydride, ALH3. When you melt aluminum hydride, it releases the hydrogen back out. So before it's melted, you've got this fuel bar, if you will. It's actually a powder, but same, same. And you can shoot a bullet at it. You can slam it into the ground at 400 miles an hour. Like it won't blow up or catch fire or go sort of chain reactive, um, which is a great thing for airplanes. We've never had a fuel like that before, right? Mm -hmm. And hydrogen can power fuel cells and the weight density for a hydrogen powered fuel cell is way better than a lithium ion battery. In fact, it's better enough to make VTOL airplanes work. So it, interesting. It's so I, I think I was right in that it's not going to be lithium ion batteries. It's going to be hydrogen. And some people are trying to use gaseous hydrogen or liquid hydrogen. And like the last time that that was tried in aviation was the Hindenburg. And it hasn't been tried since because of the Hindenburg. <laughs> it, it's just, it's just too reactive, you know? For viewers at home that don't recall, the Hindenburg uh, ended uh, poorly. But, you know, just like one note on the chemistry that you're talking about. So aluminum hydride, both aluminum and especially, of course, hydrogen are very close to the top of lightest elements that you would see for people at home looking at their periodic table, trying to understand how this would compare with lithium. So there would be some like pretty supreme weight differentials, I would think. And, and that's probably what you're referring to, yeah, right? Yeah, it works well. And some people are trying to use gaseous hydrogen. And the trouble is it takes up too much space. And in an airplane, eventually, like if you, have to, if you have to make a super guppy, super fat fuselage airplane in order to hold enough hydrogen to power it, the drag is going to kill you and you start to spin backwards on that. Conveniently, the aluminum hydride has about as much aluminum weight as the steel weight in a steel tank that holds the gas. So you're not going backwards there. In fact, it might even be a little bit lighter. So you're coming out equivalent in a lot less space. So for people at home, and and this is what I love the most about you, Paul, we are 20 minutes past any topic that we covered (laughs) in our (laughs) pre-interview and we are completely off script and it's great. And I I hope people at home feel the same way. So let, let me ask you, I've got two more questions here. Uh, back to to things I actually wrote down. So we talked about like some things that you think, hey, look, guys, stop doing this. No more ideas like this. If you need a step function improvement from batteries, that ain't coming in the lifetime of your startup. What are some things like flip the script? Talk a little bit about like Paul has had some big hits in his career. What do you think you're looking for in terms of companies that you want to invest in in this next chapter? You know, it's funny. People ask me this all the time. And the truth is I am not an idea person and I never really have been. What I'm good at is recognizing good ideas when somebody tells me one and figuring out how best to execute them. And so as an, like, I feel like an investor is the perfect job for me because I have people bring me ideas all day long Mm -hmm. and I just, I, all I have to do is say, oh, wow, that's a really great one. All that tech is within two years of now. There's a real market there. There's not too much friction in the market. You could actually sell it. That's a great idea. And and as soon as I get that light bulb in my head, I immediately shift gears to how can I help you figure out how to execute on that? 
and, and it becomes a collaborative process. But but at, at no point in time do I, I have an idea in my head where I go, I'm looking for someone who does X. I love it. It's, and, and like, what a great spot to be. You know, you're you're like the person trying. I mean, this is what you were for my company. You're coming in and saying, look, you've got the next huge idea. Let's figure out how to execute on this and make it a reality. And and I see in in you know my world at Very, we see so many great ideas come in, and it really comes down to execution. You know, that's where so many people go wrong is on the execution. I assume you see that in your world as well. Oh yeah, that's an old adage in venture world is that ideas are cheap and execution is everything. Mm-hmm. Totally. It, it's also why I, I greatly prefer operator investors because if you haven't been in the trenches executing next to the best execution people in the world, you're going to have a hard time recognizing them. Totally. So, all right, let's talk about last question. This is it. So, you know, nobody cares about anything more than the thing that they most want to see personally. You're getting into robotics as a service. What's a robot that you personally want to see more than anything else? The, the robot that I wait. That I've been waiting for, and you know, I've been reluctant to talk about it much because I I don't know if it's something I could invest in or not. But the one that I want is, is basically a solar powered Roomba, you know, uh, that will that will wander around my vineyard and cut all the weeds manually by hand right next to the ground and just leave them laying there and not cut the vines, not cut the grapevines, and then. You know, I'm already organic, but I don't have to mow anymore. You just set it loose in the spring and let it just walk around solar power so you don't have to plug it in. Just keep it inside the fence. It's good to go. So, and of course, you know, we are very big fans of the folks at Monarch Motors who are uh, developing, I believe, the first in the world electric tractor. And this sounds like a Monarch Motors like follow on product. Is this something that I know that you know Praveen and the team over there well? Does this. Is this something that you see those guys rolling out anytime soon? I could see them doing it. Like that tractor, as as nicely sized as it is, is is not as small as what's envisioned in my head. You know, like down right. down to room size. But if the if the tractor would do it, it would do it at a huge scale. So I could see a tractor doing the same thing for really big vineyards. You know, my my friends at Kendall Jackson could probably use the tractor autonomously doing that thing, which is great. I bet the folks at Kendall Jackson have had a very good pandemic. I, I, from what I understand about alcohol sales, it's been a good time to be in that business. Well, Paul, I really appreciate your time. Uh, this has been great. Thanks for coming on the show. And uh, yeah, appreciate it, man. Thanks for everything. Thank you, Ryan. You shouldn't have to worry about IoT projects dragging on or unreliable vendors. You've got enough on your plate. The right team of engineers and project managers can change a pivotal moment for your business into your competitive edge. Very's close-knit crew of ambitious problem solvers, continuous improvers, and curious builders know how to turn your ideas into a reality, on time and up to your standards. With a focus on mitigating risk and maximizing opportunity, we'll help you build an IoT solution that you can hang your hat on. Let's bring your IoT idea to life. Learn more at verypossible.com. You've been listening to Over the Air, IoT, Connected Devices, and The Journey. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to hit subscribe in your favorite podcast player and give us a rating. Have a question or an idea for a future episode? Send it to podcast at verypossible.com. See you next time.